Hello, my name's Martin Graeber. One of the most interesting aspects of the work I've done in recent years has been to look at the relationships between Sabin Bering Gould and his fellow song collectors. Today I want to focus on his contacts with Lucy Broadwood and how they work together. To do this I've used the letters that Bering Gould wrote to Broadwood, many of which she kept and which are now with her papers in the Surrey History Centre and the Vaughan Williams Memorial Library at Cecil Sharp House. I've also looked at some of the entries in Broadwood's diary, as well as some of her correspondence with other people. I've talked about the details of Sabin Bering Gould's life elsewhere, so I won't give you too much information about him today. I will, though, take a few minutes to talk a little bit about Lucy Broadwood. Lucy Ethelred Broadwood was born in 1858 at The Pavilion, a house near Melrose in Scotland, which the Broadwood family took for their summer holidays every year. You can just see the pavilion at the foot of the rainbow in this painting by James Ward from the National Gallery of Scotland. Her father, Henry Fowler Broadwood, enjoyed fishing in the River Tweed, which, as you can see, was very close to the house. Lucy was the last of eleven children. The Broadwoods had family connections with Scotland and Lucy maintained a strong interest in the country of her birth. A song that she wrote about several times in later life was The Wee Little Crudlin Do, a version of Lord Randall that her father had learned from his Scottish mother and sung to Lucy, she said, when she was only two years old. She had a very privileged upper-middle-class childhood. The family were well off due to the success of the piano business John Broadwood and Sons. During its heyday in the 1850s, the company produced 2,500 pianos a year, which were owned and played by several leading musicians many of whom visited the Broadwoods family homes in London and at Lyne in Surrey. As a result, Lucy grew up surrounded by fine music and had the best of opportunities to learn to play the piano and to sing. She was accounted a good singer, though, like most Victorian women of her class, it was not considered acceptable for her to enter the profession. Lucy's uncle, another John Broadwood, had produced a pioneering collection of folk songs taken down directly from countrymen and carol singers. A book known as Old English Songs was printed privately in 1847. Its actual title was, as you can see, considerably longer. Despite its not having been made available to the general public, it is considered a landmark publication. Lucy's father also noted some songs that he'd heard locally, and he sang them around the house, so Lucy Broadwood became familiar with folk song as a child. The songs collected by her uncle and those heard from her father were taken as the foundation for the book Sussex Songs in 1890. This was ostensibly edited by her cousin, Herbert Birch Reynardson, but he acknowledged in his preface that John Broadwood's collection had been considerably added to by his niece. Lucy had in fact added another ten songs to the sixteen originally printed, and these included some which she'd collected herself, but the notes on the songs are very limited and none of the singers is identified. Her next publication, three years later, was English County Songs, co-edited with Alec Fuller Maitland, and this time her name appeared in first place on the title page. The idea of the book was that of the publisher Andrew Tewer, and it was his plan to include songs from every county in England. This proved difficult and she relied more than she'd hoped for on material already published by other collectors, particularly Marianne Mason and Sabin Bering Gould. 
only 25 of the 95 songs in the book had been collected by its editors. But the book was generally well received, and Baring Gould praised it, as you'll hear later. Her third book, English Traditional Songs and Carols, published in 1908, was a solo effort, and 34 of the 38 songs in the book were noted and collected by Broadwood herself. Eighteen songs came from Henry Burstow of Horsham, Sussex, whose picture you can see here. Burstow was a well-known character in Horsham, a renowned bell ringer and singer who earned his living as a cobbler. He was Broadwood's most important singer and had a repertoire of 420 songs, of which Broadwood noted 41. The complete list of his songs was included in the book Reminiscences of Horsham, which he compiled with the help of local saddle maker, calligrapher and scholar William Albury. In September 1896, Broadwood visited Margaret Carr at the cottage in Dunsfold, Surrey, which she and her husband had renovated. Mrs Carr had identified a number of potential singers in the village, and the two women spent the day visiting them and arranging for them to meet at the cottage in the evening. A dozen singers arrived to sing for their supper. They were all farm labourers, apart from Mary Rugman, and they sang more than twenty songs. Broadwood visited Dunsfold again two years later to meet the same group. The cars moved to Bury in Sussex in 1901 and identified another three singers from whom Broadwood collected. Several of these songs appeared in English traditional songs and carols, but more were included in the large selection of songs from Sussex and Surrey that was published in the Journal of the Folk Song Society in 1902. Broadwood's book contains very full notes on the songs and identifies all the singers. This attention to detail reflects the more academic approach that Broadwood had adopted when she took on the role of editor of the Journal of the Folk Song Society. She had been a key figure in the society from its conception in 1898, and in 1904, when it had lost momentum, she became its secretary and, with Cecil Sharp's help, brought it back to life. She edited the Journal of the Folk Song Society from 1904 until 1926, and her influence shaped the perception of English folk song for many years. Her love for the songs of Scotland, the country of her birth, inspired another strand of her collecting. In June 1906, Broadwood travelled to Scotland and met a number of Gaelic singers, and she noted her songs with the help of young bilingual singers such as Kate MacLean of Arisaig. A few months later she had similar success in collecting Gaelic songs in Ireland. She retired from editorship of the journal in 1926 and was appointed president of the society in January 1929, but on the 22nd of August of that year she died suddenly while staying with friends. She's buried at Rusper the village nearest to Lyne, where she had played the organ and taught a Sunday school class. The 1931 issue of the journal contained 20 of the Gaelic songs noted by Broadwood from Kate MacLean, with an introduction by the collector. I'd now like to turn back to my main topic. Lucy Broadwood had been aware of Baring Gould as a writer for several years before they corresponded and met. She had an interest in religion that went beyond the ordinary, and her reading took her into other religions and to mysticism as well as her own Christian faith. In about 1883 she read Baring Gould's Some Modern Difficulties, quite a challenging book intended for clergymen in which he urges the church to accept the need to work with science rather than to stand against scientific theories like Darwin's work on evolution. 
In a lighter vein, in 1888, she read the 980 pages of Beringold's three-volume novel, Richard Cable, in two days. After hearing that he was collecting folk songs, she wrote to Bering Gould in December 1889, and a few days later received what she described as an interesting letter from him about the traditional songs of Celtic, Cornwall and Devonshire. They exchanged letters again within the month, and then in April of the following year she sent him a copy of the book Sussex Songs. There's then a gap in the correspondence, and it was over a year before she wrote to him again. The purpose was to ask about a tune that she'd discovered in Mendelssohn's papers that appeared to be similar to that to which the song Adam and Eve was performed. She'd obtained this from her brother-in-law, John Sheerm, the vicar of Ryde, who'd been born in Stratton in Cornwall. The tune was said to have been based on the peal of the bells at Stratton Church, though these have since been replaced. Beringall's letter is quite chatty and covers several topics in addition to his observation that I do not in the least think a German student here could have got among the singers among the people attached to Adam and Eve. The song was later published in English County Songs but the mystery of Mendelssohn was not remarked on again. In the same letter, Beringold comments on the words of folk songs saying, I have no great opinion of the words of many of our folk songs. I find that most of them, not all, are to be detected in broadsides. Of these, I have five thick volumes, and I've gone through all the volumes in the British Museum. They're coarse, vulgar things and void of poetry, but I find that the traditional versions are almost invariably better than the broadside versions. Broadwood was not deterred by the idea of these coarse, vulgar things as she started to build her own extensive collection of broadsides. Like Bering Gould, she found they were a useful way for filling the gaps when her singers had forgotten words or to sort out a garbled phrase in a song. Bering Gould declined her invitation to visit her at Lyne House, but he did accept her offer to hunt things out for him in the British Museum reading room. Broadwood's diary records that their correspondence became more frequent over the next two years, each of them posing and answering questions about songs they'd found and were intending to publish. Bering Gould was preparing material for what was to become a garland of country song, while Broadwood was working on English county songs. In his letters, Bering Gould told her about some of the singers that he'd met or was hoping to meet. He wrote, for example, I'm off early tomorrow morning to Dartmouth, where I hear of an old fellow who boasts he knows thousands of songs. That man was William Pepperell of Kingsweir near Dartmouth. In my own collection I have the letter that Beringald wrote to the unnamed man who told him about the singer. In it, he talks about the logistical difficulties of collecting songs without one of his colleagues to take down the music, and so needing access to a piano. In the event, his concern was unnecessary, since Pepperell, the man of a thousand songs, only gave him one song. Luckily, Beringald had planned to move on to stay with another person who'd written to him with promises of good singers. This was Bertha Bidder of Stoke Fleming, who turned out to be a more reliable judge of a good singer and introduced him to three women living near her at Stoke Fleming. From these he heard a number of good songs. Beringald told Broadwood about his visit to Stoke Fleming in a letter shortly afterwards and of his having obtained some interesting and sound tunes. He also told her about a man he'd met while he was there. I made the acquaintance of a poor old ragged fiddler with white hair, a beautiful, intelligent face, 
a man whose occupation is gone. He's somewhat of a dreamer, and not a little given, I fear, to liquor, but a genuine musical enthusiast and desperately poor. I've promised him sixpence for every genuine old balladaire that he can pick up for me, and he's going round the country for that purpose. This was Peter Isaacs, a failed shoemaker who'd turned to maintaining harness to make a modest living. Beringald used him as the basis of the character Daniel Jacobs in a short story. Unfortunately, Isaacs was another disappointment. He only cost Beringald a shilling for the two songs he gave him. He was also mentioned in a letter written on the 8th of March, 1893. My poor old fiddler, Peter Isaacs of Stoke Fleming, has been in Exeter jail, locked up because he slept in a barn and smoked there. The singing birds are not, I'm sorry to say, a very respectable lot, but I love them and I'm sure they love me. In his letter, he gave a nice illustration of the difficulties faced by the researcher. He asked Broadwood to have a look at a chapbook containing the song The Rocks of Scilly when she was next in the British Library and copy out the first verse for him because he said, I copied all out, but my verse one was in pencil and got so rubbed that I cannot read it, though all the rest is legible enough. English County Songs was published on the 1st of July, but any joy that Broadwood felt was dampened by the illness of her father, who died a week later. Beringald wrote saying, I'm so grieved to hear of your loss. It's particularly sad as your father took such an interest in your collection. This is another long letter. In March he'd told her of his visit to see Sam Fone at Mary Tavy and sent a list of the songs that he'd heard from phone and in the august letter he added more to that list in some cases he gives brief descriptions of the song such as at the setting of the sun curious ballad of a young man shooting his true love when to escape rain she had put an apron round her head and he mistook her for a swan good sound melody he told her that he was going to be at the British Museum in the following week, and they arranged to meet there. The meeting did not go well, as Beringald's letter of the 7th of August says, I wish we could have had a longer talk. I feel that an apology is due to you for not being in the outer hall. I thought you meant the inner passages. I went there at 11.30 and walked up and down some time. As you did not arrive, I ran back to my desk, but came again at intervals of five minutes and looked into the entrance passage again and again in vain. It was not inattention to an arrangement, but a misunderstanding of whereabouts. Perhaps to make up for the misunderstanding, he invited her to visit Lou Trenchard and to see one of the series of costume concerts that he'd organised. You'll hear more about this visit shortly. He thanked her for sending him a copy of English County Song, saying that he was delighted with it and hoped that she would do another book of them. He sent her comments on many of the songs in it, comparing them to variants that he had heard. He wrote, I rather doubt the appropriating of several to counties individually as several a common property through England. This was a point that has often been made about the idea that you can assign songs to particular areas or even countries, but the same could also be said of Beringald's own book. Arrangements for Broadwood's visit to Lou Trenchard were the subject of further letters throughout August, and she arrived in the evening of Monday the 4th of September, 1893. Her diary entry for that day details her journey from Ryde, where she had been staying with her sister Mary and her husband, Reverend John Sheehan, the vicar of Ryde, and passed her to Queen Victoria when she was at Osborne House. Broadwood travelled for part of the journey with John Sheehan's brother Edward and his family, who were holidaying in Devon and Cornwall. 
Broadwood spent the following day with Beringald looking at his manuscript and broadside collections and having long talks with him. In the evening they had the promised outing to Lanson, and her diary records went to the folk song concert in the town of Miss Bustle's getting up. Her intended, Mr Pemberton, Mr Ferguson, a good baritone, and two indifferent professional ladies sang in costumes, brackets, poor, tunes very loudly. Mr Ferguson especially excelled in Ormond the Brave. Arthur Foxton Ferguson continued to take an interest in folk songs and later performed in further concerts of Beringald's songs. There's a photograph of him dressed up for one of the costume concerts. Ferguson also sent Broadwood a number of songs that he'd collected in the home counties in Yorkshire. Over the next few days, Broadwood went out on walks with Beringald's daughters and their friends and spent some time boating on the lake near the house. She also went with him and his daughter Vera on a choir outing to Ensley Gardens. There was an opportunity for song collecting when she went out with Beringald to the hamlet of Dunterton in the Tamar Valley. Broadwood reports that, during the journey, there were interesting talks there and back. They had tea with the vicar's wife, Alice Cann, before going to see Jane Jeffrey in a nearby cottage. Beringald had heard that Mrs Jeffrey was a singer late in the previous year, but she'd then had a stroke and had been unable to sing. By September, she was able to give Beringald and Broadwood a version of Cold Blows the Wind, for which Lucy Broadwood noted the tune. Beringald noted the fragments of words that Mrs Jeffrey remembered and later sent them to Francis Child. Beringald and Broadwood were both interested in her last two verses, which were different to those they'd heard before. Broadwood had published a version in English county songs and later included the song in her English traditional songs and carols, but only used Mrs Jeffrey's last two verses, with a version from Shropshire to complete the text. Broadwood left on the Saturday and met Edward Shearm and his family at Oakhampton. After a walk on Dartmoor, they travelled on to Bude, where they were to stay at the castle where Beringald had coincidentally spent holidays with his family as a child. Broadwood's diary lists the friends and family she met over the next 11 days. She also sat out on the shore, though she did note that the weather was cold and that she was feeling rather feverish. There's a letter that Broadwood wrote to Mr. Later Lord Farrer while she was staying at Bude, and in it she says, I've just come from the Bering Goulds, where I had delightful talks and walks with the quaint and entertaining author and his wife and fourteen children. Now I am here with John Shearm's brother. On the way back, the Goulds bid me stay with them again. He and I capture old songs from old singers in the cottages and have great fun over it. She crossed back into Devon on the 20th of September and Beringald drove out in his dog cart to fetch her from Ashbury Station. On their way back to Lou Trenchard, he showed her the place near Bratton Clavelli, where Mary Ann Voden, regarded as a white witch, lived. Broadwood wrote in her diary, We drove six miles to Lou Trenchard, passing a white witch's house. Roofless, doorless, windowless, and with the upper floor entirely fallen in, the white witch lives under her umbrella and has no furniture but three Bibles, which she knows by heart. Beringald knew Marianne well and wrote about her several times. She had been offered help, but refused to leave her house until things became so desperate that she was taken to the workhouse in Oakhampton where she sadly died not long afterwards. Over the next two days, Broadwood had more walks and talks with Bering Gould and undertook a little more song collecting, walking up the hill behind Lou House to meet Eliza and Louisa, the daughters of Richard and Margaret Hamley, the tenants of Downhouse Farm. 
Baring Gould had written to the American ballad scholar Francis Child in June of that year, saying that, Last Christmas at our choir supper and dance, two strapping farmer's daughters stood up and sang right through the Squire of Tamworth to my great satisfaction. He'd noted two songs from them in July of that year, so it's likely that he had suggested to Lucy Broadwood that there might be more. The girls sang her two songs, Nothing Else to Do, and the children's song, Green Gravel. The following morning, Beringall drove her over to see Mary Fletcher, a farmer's widow at Carley near Lifton, from whom she heard three songs, two of which she'd learned from her mother in about 1830. While looking at the census, I discovered that Mary Fletcher was the sister of Margaret Hamley, whose daughters she'd met the previous day, and this gave me a different perspective of what happened in that part of Lucy Broadwood's visit. I could imagine Broadwood's excitement, returning from visiting the Hamleys and telling Baring Gould about Margaret Hamley's sister and persuading him, not that he would have needed much persuading, that they should visit her immediately. Her visit over, Broadwood left for Ride the following day. Their correspondence continued with exchanges of information about songs and family events, and there were some meetings in London when Baring Gould was in town. Then in May 1894, Baring Gould wrote to Lucy Broadwood saying, I'm thinking of writing an article for some ladies' magazine or paper to urge ladies to collect folk songs, and I should like to instance your energy and work. May I do so? Bering Gould's article, The Collection of Folk Airs, was published in The Queen, the ladies' newspaper, in December 1894. In this he tried to persuade the readers to go out and collect folk songs, and he cited Lucy Broadwood as one of his examples of a successful female collector. He also cited another example. Last year, a lady on the south coast of Devon near Dartmouth wrote to tell me that she believed there was at least one woman in the parish where she lived who remembered old songs. Would I visit her and ascertain their value? Well, of course I went and was taken to a farmhouse where this woman was then engaged washing. The farmer's wife very kindly said she could spare her for an hour and then I got this singer, Mary Langworthy is her name, to tell me what songs she could recall and to chant me a verse of each. I very soon satisfied myself that I'd come upon a new vein of melody and of words. The songs Mary Langworthy knew she had acquired from her mother long ago dead. The lady in question was Bertha Bidder, who I mentioned earlier, and among the songs that Beringald heard from Mary Langworthy was the lovely version of The Trees They Grow So High with its tune in the Phrygian mode that many of us discovered in the Penguin Book of English Folk Songs. In the book, it was said that it was sung by an unnamed singer, Stoke Fleming. Since the information that Miss Bidder had later passed to Lucy Broadwood for publication in the Journal of the Folk Song Society didn't identify the singer. It gave me great pleasure to pass on these details to the editor of the 2009 version of Classic English Folk Songs, and that enabled Mary Langworthy to take her proper place in the pantheon of English folk singers. Broadwood's manuscript only has Mary Langworthy's second verse. The rest has been lost. Neither has Beringald's original notation of Langworthy's words survived. In the Penguin book, A.L. Lloyd used words from Sharp and Broadwood for the other verses. 1894 started badly with a round of influenza that hit the Beringald household. Beringald wrote, We're in a sad condition here. Our butler died early this morning. The governess and one of the children are in bed. Others sickening. Myself just recovering and obliged to run about the parish when I ought not to be out to visit. The undergardener in bed also. We're without cook and losing our housemaid next week and, oh, the worry of work. I'm writing fairy tales between pastoral visits and running about seeking nurses for the sick. 
He also reports problems with his musical collaborator, Henry Fleetwood Shepherd, who'd lost interest in folk songs and was sitting on the number of tunes that Bering Gould needed to be barred. He makes a very important point when he says, I cannot bar as I cannot hit on the time in which they sing, a difficult matter to decide even for a musician, I fancy, for actually they have no time. This freedom of rhythm and structure was a problem for many collectors, and forcing tunes sung in the traditional way onto lines on a page often misrepresents the song. Broadwood had been given a copy of Frank Kidson's traditional tunes in 1891, but didn't get in contact with him until January 1893. She stayed with Kidson in Leeds in the following April, and she must have asked him what he thought of Beringald's book, as in May he gave a lengthy critique in which he expresses his dislike of their interpretation of tunes and the editing of the words. He says... I cannot believe that a single song is there placed as it was sung to Bering Gould. Neither does Kitson like the informal way in which Bering Gould refers to his singers, and prefers to refer to them as Mr. rather than Old John So-and-so. Broadwood then seems to have asked Bering Gould for his opinion of Kitson's work, as he responded in a letter sent in August 93, saying... I do not think much of Kidson's collection. If you examine it, you will see he's taken down very few himself from the pothouse singers. And Barrett told me that he mistrusted his version as taken by persons who didn't understand the character of the music they noted for him. Broadwood gave Kidson an account of her visit to Lou Trenchard, and he responded, I was glad to hear that you had such a pleasant time at Mr. Bering Gould's. I can quite understand how delightful it must have been. He's certainly a singularly talented man. His novels, I think, hold a very high place in the literature of today. The little I saw of him personally gave me a very pleasant impression of his kindness. It's his treatment of the songs of the West that has rather vexed me. My personal feeling is the utmost dread of popularity for the old traditional and country song. To me, they're very sacred, and to hear them sung by people who have not the slightest sympathy with them would be very galling. Then would come the arrangement of them by popular music caterers. Then farewell to all their freshness. Now, these are views that... Broadwood shared, preferring to keep the songs in the hands of a select few, rather than to popularise them as Bering Gould and Sharp sought to do. This was the reason that Kidson didn't have accompaniments in traditional tunes. The songs in Broadwood's three books all had accompaniments, but the principle she established of not including accompaniments with songs published in the Journal of the Folk Song Society is maintained to this day. The journal did not at that time carry reviews. Nonetheless, in 1925, Lucy Broadwood penned an editorial note in which she effectively reviewed Kidson's book A Garland of English Folk Songs. She reminded the journal's readers that Kidson had been a loyal supporter of the Folk Song Society from the day of its inauguration and that he will always occupy a place of especial distinction. She went on, with this in mind, no excuse need be offered for a slight departure from the recognised custom as regards the journal, in which reviews of folk songs or folk music in art form cannot be undertaken. Mr Alfred Moffat's accompaniments set off the beauty and rhythm of the songs without masking their melody. Bering Gould gave his own view in a letter when he said, presumably in response to another prod from Broadwood. I do not think it well to publish the airs alone. They then sink into a mere archaeological curiosity. No spell of renewed life is given them. Kidson's will remain death-struck until some musician takes them in hand. Things changed when Beringold stayed with Kidson in 1894. After that, the two men became friends, and in Beringald's mammoth compilation, English Minstrelsy, 
Kidson was praised for his help in giving him valuable hints relative to the history of some of the songs. In 1896 and then again in 1897, there are letters from Kidson to Broadwood suggesting that she has raised further issues about Bering Gould, but his response to the last relating to a review of English minstrelsy is firmly on Bering Gould's side. Kidson visited Lou Trenchard in 1911 and wrote a lengthy and very positive article about his stay for the Yorkshire Weekly Post. I'd like to think that the way Broadwood has raised these issues in private correspondent, without the other correspondent seeing it, is mischievous rather than malicious. The correspondence between Bering Gould and Broadwood continued, though the last letter in the archives is that of the 21st of January 1900, when he said that he was most delighted to hear from you again, and answers a question about an apple song, and tells her of the deaths of his key singer James Parsons and his friend Daniel Radford. I have a letter in my own collection from Bering Gould to Lucy Broadwood. It isn't dated and was written in haste. Broadwood had asked Bering Gould if she could come to visit, and Bering Gould offers his regrets but cannot put her up as the house is full already. Now, if that seems surprising given the size of the house, remember that he had 15 children and there may well have been building work going on. He told her that, had she been able to visit, he would have been able to take her to meet an old woman who had known the original Uncle Tom Cobbley and sang one of his songs. He never did get to hear this song. Broadwood did, however, visit Lou Trenchard again in September 1912, and as before she spent the afternoon talking and walking with Mr Bering Gould and looking at his folk song books. Then, after spending the following morning in further talking and reading, she took the train back to Plymouth, where she had been staying. But Bering Gould was no longer active in folk song collecting, and so they had little left to talk about. I don't believe either party would have regarded the other as a friend, though their interactions were cordial enough. Nevertheless, it's surprising that Bering Gould's death is not recorded in her diary though that of Cecil Sharp a few months later got the equivalent of an illuminated entry, despite her low opinion of him. The 1924 Journal of the Folk Song Society, of which she was the editor, included obituary notices for Sharp and for Ch Sir Charles Stanford, who both died in that year, but did not record Bering Gould's passing. She was a complex woman, and totally committed to the causes she believed in. In the later years of his life, Bering Gould could offer little other than his reputation to help her. In preparing for this talk, I've come to realise how little I really know about Lucy Broadwood. Much of the biographical work on her in the last few years has focused on her diaries, and I don't believe that these tell us as much as we might hope or assume. They are a rather mechanical, though useful, record of events, not like Bering Gould's diaries that give us some insight into his thoughts and feelings. We don't have many letters in which Broadwood tells friends about her delights and disappointments. I'd like to know what she thought was her greatest achievement. Was it her work on folk song? Or was there a lingering disappointment that she didn't make it into the mainstream of classical music? Certainly she spent a great deal of her time moving in those higher circles of the musical world. She was immensely able, and I think I would have been terrified of her. But she had a good sense of humour. Frank Howes, who took over as editor of the Journal of the Folk Song Society in 1927, and who was chief music critic for the Times, wrote an article in 1958 to celebrate the centenary of Broadwood's birth. In it, he tells how Broadwood once made up a pseudo-folk song and tried it on Alec Fuller Maitland with a view to getting it included in English county songs. Her co-editor considered it to be so fine a tune that he made a piano accompaniment for it. 
intellectual honesty prevailed over the triumphant hoax, and Maitland was duly undeceived. When collecting songs in person, Broadwood's interactions with the singers were limited by her ways of working. She usually met the singers at a place where she was staying with friends like Mrs Carr and not in their own homes or pubs. She only met her most prolific singer Henry Burstow twice and relied on his sending her the words of the small proportion of his repertoire that she recorded. In describing her collecting, Chris Behrman used Mao Zedong's analogy of guerrilla fighters as fish swimming among the civil population. Other song collectors like Baring Gould and Sharp were in the ocean, swimming with the fish, while Broadwood kept her feet dry. A reasonable explanation and excuse for this lies in her gender. It was difficult for a woman to go out into the environment where the songs were to be found, and that difficulty was magnified by the expectations of her class. We cannot say with accuracy how many songs Broadwood collected, as many of her manuscripts have gone missing over the years. If we were playing the numbers game, she could not come close to Sharp's tally and falls well short of the modern collectors who vacuum up songs with their recorders. But her contribution as an editor and as an enabler was enormous, and deserves to be celebrated more. Her influence on the course of the folk song revival echoes down the years, and we would have been vastly the poorer without her efforts. Thank you very much for watching and listening to my talk. I hope you've enjoyed it.